Welcome to Cultivate, a Veritas Academy podcast, where we explore truth, beauty, and goodness through meaningful conversation. We invite you to join us in discussions meant to edify your mind, encourage your heart, and equip your family to live abundantly in Christ. Welcome back to Cultivate. I'm Ty Fisher, head of school here at Veritas Academy. And this episode is going to be, I know I say that everything's going to be a real treat. This one is actually, because we've decided to give you a little teaser. I know we've made you wait for season two. So this is going to be a little teaser. We're going to be launching season two on January 21st from the Tide House Restaurant in Lidditz. So please RSVP for the launch event. We're going to have a panel. We're going to talk about the upcoming season and we're going to have a lot of fun. So the other part of the treat is that I have a good friend here today, Mm -hmm. Leslie Bustard. Leslie and Ned and Emily and Ty go way back Mm -hmm. and uh, they've been such wonderful friends over a number of decades here. She's one of my favorite people, lives in Lancaster City with her husband, Ned, and their two dogs. She's a writer and author. She is a former teacher here at Veritas. She taught in both the grammar school and the secondary school. She's the vice president of Square Halo Publications, and she's one of the leaders behind the Square Halo Conference coming up called Ordinary Saints. Her husband is the, what I would call, one of the artistic forces behind the rise of classical education. So, Leslie, thanks for coming in today. Oh, I'm very glad to be here. Yeah. Well, here's the here's the other thing that's really fun is that we're going to talk about a topic that I know is close to your heart mm-hmm. and that I really believe cultivate listeners if you listen to this podcast and just start to take some some baby steps forward. Mm. It's going to be something that resonates in your heart because it has resonated in the hearts of people for all of history. And that that's poetry. So some of you might be asking, why are we having a podcast about poetry? Well, poetry, it's linked to music and song, is one of the most important and most powerful forms of communication in all of history, as especially as we look back through history, we see that poets were some of the most important people, and that any school that's a classical school that cares about communications, that cares about rhetoric, is going to be fascinated with poetry. So we're here to talk about poetry today and learning how to love poetry. So Leslie, let's just want to start off with this basic question, what is poetry? Mm, so that probably would be, what is that, the $100 million question? I know, I know. <laughs> it's like when I ask Ned, what is uh, art? What is art or yeah. what is beauty? Yeah. What is poetry? So Robert Frost says, poetry is a way of remembering what it would impoverish us to forget. Whoa. Could you say that again? I will. It's, it's like there's a path in the woods, right? That's exactly. The, that's, there's that's, a path in the woods. <laughs> Poetry is a way of remembering what it would impoverish us to forget. Hmm. That, that, that almost reminds me of like some lines in Tolkien, you know, where mm-hmm. things were, things end up being forgotten and that's terrible. So exactly. Okay. So there's also something that's important to, to know about poetry is that the way, maybe not Every single poet, poem, of course, but there's a lyricalness. Mm -hmm. There's something a way that the poet has put words together that Dana Joya, he's a poet and a writer that I love. He says it brings us to a place of enchantment. Okay. That other ways of words or artwork... They, they're not going to do it that way. They're going to lead us in a different way. But poetry leads us in a way that brings us to an, a heightened sense, um, to an enchantment. It mm. might just last for a minute or even a second. Yeah. But there's something that because poetry takes almost like our whole being, our whole self, mm-hmm. it 
it moves us in a way that other things don't. Okay. So you have when you are really entering into poetry, you're going to use your memory, you're going to use your imagination, mm -hmm. you're going to use your mind, your heart. There's something about good poetry that's going to do that yeah. for you. Yeah. Did we... Did we define poetry there or not? Well, you see, I don't know. <laughs> so it's so, it, so is it is it kind of mm -hmm. like I think of poetry in song as you know inter interlinked. Yes. You know, in the ancient world, if you think about like Homer and mm -hmm. that, that 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 wasn't just read in a book; it was sung by a poet. Yes, it's like it's it's glorified language. It's language yes. that's that's kind of lifted up, but it really, it helps us to see the world in a exactly. different way, doesn't it? It does. And I appreciate you saying that because those are things that have gone through in my mind. You know, I was just saying to you about how Dana Joya would say that he puts this with poetry as well. So we want to think about that big picture of beauty, truth, and goodness, yep. right? So poetry Sounds like, is, a, like classical education yes, might be interested exactly. in this. So poetry fits in that, at least historically it has. And so when we think about beauty, beauty is that way that shows us what the world really is. Mm. And so poetry can also do that for us. Now that doesn't mean every poem is going to either be about a beautiful topic or even maybe sound beautiful. Mm -hmm. Isn't that kind of also the mystery of beauty yeah. as well? That it grabs your attention. It causes you to stop. So beauty will grab your attention. It causes you to notice something maybe that you've never thought about before. And then it almost, even again, if it's for a second, it reveals something about the world to your mind, mm. um, about the reality of the world. You know, that reminds me of a quote from Charles Williams, who is, uh, was one of the Inklings mm -hmm. with Lewis and Tolkien. And he was in his book, The Figure of Beatrice, the last line of the book says, we have not begun to see or to be seen. Mm. And and what he's he's talking about Dante and Beatrice who mm. are statuized up right behind me here. But what Dante Protestants are always scared of seeing things and and seeing God through them. We we want to see minimal. Mm. We want to be minimal. And of course mm. At the time of the Reformation, you know, there's a good good reason to say, like, boy, exactly. images have gotten out of hand, those kinds of things. But what Dante is saying is not, you know, Dante and Beatrice. He didn't want to date with Beatrice. He saw God through her. Mm -hmm. And what what Williams is saying is it, it's not it's not Beatrice that's special. Every one of us is that it's that maximalizing way of seeing the world. And what you're saying is poetry helps us see the world in the way Williams was telling us to see the people around us, yes. to see God through through that. So that's so, okay, folks, if you listen to that, go back, go, like go back, <laughs> you listen to that, you need to start reading poetry, yes. right? Yes. Well, I want to share a couple other things. Sure. Again, to Dana Joya, because he's been really my tutor a lot in how I think about And Dana about Joya, words. I, thought, I thought was a girl, but it's actually a guy. He is. Yeah. So. And he is a very, he's a gentleman, I yeah. think, when I listen to him. So he explains that poetry is a distinct category of language, mm -hmm. a special way of speaking that invites and rewards a special way of listening. Because at its foundation, it is a form of oral communication. Poetry needs to sound different from ordinary speech. So it is something that has in it a form of demand mm -hmm. and an invitation to attention and response. Mm. So this is why in, in many poems, especially when we look back in history of poetry, that you would see meter, and then okay. you'd have all different types of meter. I personally, in my struggles with learning, I have a hard time with meter. Like, I would be teaching iambic pentameter, and I'm like, I know it's there, and I can do it, and I can write it out, but I have a hard time hearing it sometimes. Mm. It makes it hard for me to write it. Like, if I've tried to write sonnets in that, but that's why we have meter. That's why there's rhyme and different types of rhyme schemes. Not every poem is going to be A, B, A, B, or A, B, C, A, B, C. And that's why there's like alliteration. That's why poets would use 
the same sound, you know, within a, a line, you might get the b sound a couple of times. Yeah. Or the assonance sound where you you hear the same sound within a word. Okay. And that's repeated close to each other. Not to sound like a joke or a limerick, although limericks are fun, but to help the reader hear, maybe get the point of what they're trying to say, especially if it's being read out loud. Yeah. So well, like we were saying, the aim of poetry is to awaken that that fuller sense of our humanity. Okay. Now, as you've already pointed out, there are many great poets living today, Mm -hmm. but this is not like the golden age of poetry. Like the most, the power, or maybe we could say in some ways it's kind of a disenchanted age. Um, Well, I, I think if you do, and you were referring back to this earlier, when you look at what was happening when poetry starts, that's, that's basically like the first form, right, of storytelling, yep. of communicating. And so, like you said, Homer, even so you've got it in the ancient cultures, you have it in the medieval times. A poet was someone who was that person who was like the conduit of a culture remembering mm-hmm. who they were or was telling the stories that would be part of the formation of who mm-hmm. they were as a culture. Yeah. So again, not as many stories that are being thrown at people like we are in our age today. So you would have a poet sharing stories that would go wide uh-huh. and everyone in some way or another would be sharing those right. stories. And then eventually they get written down and then they're discovered or rediscovered and then they're shared. So in one way we have, we have let go of that way of binding a people together. So, and, 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 and that's part of maybe the fragmentation that yes, we experience. I think so. Now we have like, you would, Look at someone like Robert Frost, who was our poet laureate, Mm -hmm. and he would be someone who would be something that we we would all share Mm -hmm. when he would have given, say, the recited the poem at John F. K.'s inaugural address. Yeah, that would have been an important moment for our culture, but it it would have been a bigger thing years and years and years, decades yeah. before. Yeah. And you saw that happen when President Biden became president and the young lady, I think her name was Amanda Gorman. Mm. She recited this long poem and it was pretty amazing. African-American? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I and remember And she was her. a teenager and she got everybody so excited about poetry right. and about what poetry can actually do for a culture. Okay. So I think one of the reasons is fragmentation because we don't, we don't have a common story. We don't, we don't. And I think we also, I think poetry causes us to have to slow down mm. and poetry. We don't want, Americans don't, don't want that. That's hard. That yeah. we're, we're not in a, place doesn't where seem we can efficient, do Leslie. It doesn't actually, <laughs> it's not very utilitarian. Yeah. So let's let's make this a little bit more personal. Okay. You love poetry. I do. How did you how did you learn to love poetry? Mm. So I went to a uh, a Christian school, Wilmington Christian School in Hocaston, Delaware. That's where I graduated from, and I just had some really great English teachers and literature teachers. So I know I don't remember everything we read, but I know there must have been things that we read that planted seeds because. I then, when I graduated from high school, had like the complete works of Robert Frost and the complete works of Emily Dickinson. And I know I had been told about William Carlos Williams because who can forget that name? Oh, yeah, I yeah. mean, I literally can still remember that thought, like, which probably everyone else has thought, like, who names their child that? Yeah. So, and I think I really, you know, you get introduced to those two short poems of his about the plum and about the, the red wagon. Yeah. So like those were inside of me as well as I just loved so many of the books they had us read at school. So then jump forward my junior year in college, I'm taking a, a Puritan class. Okay. It was either all about the Puritans or it was about early American. And it was like a 300 level course. So you of course went a lot deeper mm-hmm. and I was a history major and I had to do a paper and I must've been introduced to Anne Bradstreet in that class because she became, I was like, that's what I'm going to write my paper about. (laughs) And I just dove into her and that's before the internet. So there I am, you know, looking through all of the library, trying to figure out how to find other things about Anne Bradstreet. 
And I discovered her writing. And the paper was about not just her life, but it ended up being about how she, as a Christian woman, wrote poetry that was, one, excellent, because she was very Mm well-educated and very well-read. But it was like, other than not her history poems, which didn't do anything for me, but her everyday poems about her life, where she showed me what it was like to be a woman who wanted to glorify God and loved her family and loved her life and understood the heart's conflict of that. And it, it's, it was kind of like reading the Psalms. But, but, that, but that, made, that made you see your life yes. with, with new eyes. It did. You saw things that might have not been as attractive to you in the, in the light of truth, mm-hmm. what, they're, what they really, really, the, the, the way that you could see them as full of beauty. And it made me realize that the struggles I had as a college student of wanting to be someone who loved the Lord above all things but didn't and was taken in by good things and the things of the world, that that wasn't a struggle that Mm. I was the only one who had that struggle. So she taught me and my heart to keep pursuing the Lord. Okay. And so I just loved, I loved the, the sacredness Mm. of her life that, that I ended up, that was like a seed that showed me that life didn't have to be sacred and secular. It was all sacred. That's what led me into seeing how poetry could be personal. Yeah. But then I ended up once, I, I, I didn't pursue more poetry because I was doing other things, but then I became a mom. And then as Carrie got older and then we added other children, I just loved Those reading. words became even more important, well, didn't they? True. But then I discovered children's poetry. Like oh. I knew about, you know, the Garden of Verses by Robert Louis Stevenson, but I ended up finding other um, books of poetry. One that I really remember is uh, Sing a Song of Popcorn. There's another one that I think I have loaned to someone and I can't remember the title, but I loved it even more than that one. But it was an anthology of poetry, like one section's weather, one section seasons, one section's holidays. You know, it's, yeah. it, and it was just delightful. And I learned that idea that people might get tired of me saying this, but where C.S. Lewis says, if something is written, it's written specifically for children, but an adult can't enjoy it, then a child shouldn't be given to it. Uh-huh. And so I was discovering that in poetry. Okay. And so that was my diet of poetry for a while, was children's poetry, because uh-huh. it just delighted me and I loved reading it. And then I've always been a big fan of Manolingle, and through Manolingle, and now we're getting to the punchline, okay. I discovered Lucy Shaw. Lucy Shaw was one of Manolingle's best friends. She was married to Harold Shaw, who is who had founded Shaw Publishing. Okay. Shaw Publishing had published a lot of Manolingles, especially Christian spiritual writing. Mm -hmm. And so they were friends. And I had a book that they had collaborated on. And through that, I read some of her poetry. And that's when I met a poet who became a means of grace for my life. Mm -hmm. I would read, and a lot of her poetry is about nature. And I didn't really start off to be someone who like, could name trees. I still can't, but needed to be out in nature. I was usually the one who wanted to be wandering around museums or the beach, but like, I don't really need to to be in love with trees, but there was something about the way she made both following Jesus, a spiritual life, a a life formed Mm. by scripture, as well as a life formed by the world around them being nature and your relationships, how those go together. She just opened my eyes and my imagination to the things of the Lord that helped me know his love and grew my love for him. That's that's wonderful, but typically in our day, Christians, and maybe I, I can be a little bit even more pointed than that, especially Protestant Christians, mm-hmm. or maybe I can be a little bit more pointed than that, maybe like Reformed Presbyterian yes. <laughs> Christians, which I know both of us are, we are, they struggle with poetry. Yes. Why Why is that? Well, I think part of that- I was is- going to say rationalist Christians, but mm-hmm. I'm, I'm not going to call myself a rationalist, sure. even though I do think that the Holy Spirit works according to the clock. 
I, sure. Right. So we have to start church on <laughs> right, time exactly, and end church and on it time. at a certain time. Right. Um, except for the fact that he moves through the trees like the wind and who can see the wind? But I think there's my, I could go in different ways to answer, <laughs> right? That question. Yeah. But I think there's a couple ways to answer that. Protestants, especially Reformed Protestants, we are word based and we are people who, who love to hang around in the things of the mind. And so I think it's been, and not that all of this is bad, but I think we have forgotten how we need our imagination, how we can't actually get our heart to always love what we need to love just by thinking the right things. Mm, Um, That's so true. And that's hard. Yeah. (laughs) Because that has been a lot of my quest, not just my quest has been poetry, but my quest as a Christian wanting to follow the Lord well was to have my theological ducks all in a row. I wanted all of those dots connected, but we want to, we want to do it right. We want to glorify God in how we're thinking. And so we have lost in many ways that there's mystery in the things of the Lord and that there's beauty in the things of the Lord and that the spirit does kind of go around in ways that we're not expecting. And so we do need for our heart to love what God loves. We need our imagination to be open. So, so we need to be okay with being a child. Yes. Okay. Yeah, because children, so true. the, you know, I've, I've been at Presbyterian worship services where the Lord's Supper is served. And I remember once the pastor stood up and he said, this is, and he was going to be very doctrinally careful, this is not the corporeal body of Christ. This is not this. This is not that. Ooh. This is not this. This is not that. Let's have communion. Yeah, and and I'm like, 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 like uh, okay. Uh, okay, could you tell yeah, me what I'm doing? No, no, yeah, yeah. So <laughs> it, it, uh, we're very comfortable yes. with negations that yes. get us to like doctrinal safety. And doctrinal safety is important. But that kind of enchantment is what a child feels. Yeah. So. And it is, it's easy as you grow up to lose that enchantment yeah. for many, many different reasons. Yeah. So I think, I think in like one way we do Like the heating bill or something like exactly. that. Right. Exactly. So I think, I think that's one reason is that we don't, we don't understand the role of imagination. Yeah. And, and, and then we get out imagined by secular folks. Yes. Who are actually stealing Christian story structures. Exactly. Right. They're, they're using our imagination exactly. against us. Because we have lost, we, we've lost that somehow. And I think, especially, I can speak to like American culture, mm. a Christian culture, is that we've also felt that we needed our creativity to be able to spread the gospel. So poetry, if it fits well in doing the things of Jesus, or if we're going to talk about Jesus in a certain way, then it can be a utilitarian. Yeah. But it, it's not very practical. Yeah. In it's, it's, spreading. Hard, it's hard to have a poem that ends in the last line, are you ready to repent? Exactly. Right. How do you do a poem? And exactly, like <laughs> I'm raising my hand. But so I think in that way. And this, I also think about this, not just for Christians, but for our culture at large, that poetry in the past century, last century, it, and this doesn't have to be bad, uh-huh. but the new criticism form of, of how we're going to take poetry or even stories and we're going to, we're going to dissect it and discuss it and analyze it. And I love doing those things, okay. but it, it, that takes away the enchantment. Yep. So in one way, poetry and other ways of thinking about literature became almost like a science mm-hmm. because you're dissecting it and you're trying to get to what's, what is the poet saying. Yeah. But And that's fun in some ways. But then what ends up happening is you get that not just in colleges, but it trickles then down into the classroom. And so no longer are kids just throughout their years in school, just memorizing good poems, they're being given like a poem and then they have to like think about it and think about like, they're not given the opportunity to just enjoy it. Yep. And this is part of the history of us and poetry is that poetry becomes part of like the even more like the capital A art. 
And so a lot of poets then are going to be writing poetry that just the ordinary person is not going to understand. Yeah. It's the more obscure, the better. Exactly. The more artsy, the, it's just cool. And so then poetry is no longer like it used to be for just everybody and sure. the ordinary person. Well, in, in reading the Psalms, you know, David's writing poetry. Exactly. And it, but but it's, not, it's not poetry where the words are hard to understand it's not yes. obscure as the deer pants for the water right i understand that no yeah yeah exactly. yeah i um, mean and that is what also gets for me when we think about the psalms being poetry uh-huh. is that like i can understand that i would have understood a deer panting because of books or picture books i'd read or my children would have understood it other things within the Psalms or even Jesus's parables that had to do with say the land because we drive around the land. Uh-huh. But as our children get further away from the natural real world, yeah. they're not going to know how things work. And then are they going to understand how a deer pants and how that could be a metaphor for your own heart? Mm. So again, another reason that poetry can kind of heal the amnesia that exactly. we have culturally. Exactly. And I don't think we understand that because again, that's very mysterious. Mm. It, you can't do, okay, do A, B, and C, and then you're going to get D. You're you're going to say, start reading poetry to your kids early on. Start reading good books to your children early on. Yeah. And then they're going to be able to enter into the story of scripture because then they're going to get that idea of like, well, you're not going to tell them it's metaphor, but they're going to kind of understand metaphor. Well, let's, let's, let's go in that practical direction. So let's say you, your reaction to this podcast is what we want it to be. And you say something like, what must I do to love poetry? Like, like I repent, I'm going to, so, so you're, you're, you know, it's you're kind turning of, around and going an, in the right direction. It's an ax to, it's right. an ax to moment, right? So how can, when you're, when you're approaching a poem, how can you approach it profitably mm-hmm. and how can you make that poetry a part of your life and a part of the life of your family? And then I'm going to ask one question at mm-hmm. the end of, of this little line of questioning that maybe you and I will have a tough time answering, but I'll I'll just leave it. Oh, good. Yeah. So I think the first thing I'm going to share is a confession. Okay. You need me to turn sideways? No, that's okay. okay. (laughs) I'm I'm very easy in sharing sharing this confession because I think it's it's good to be real. I have just, oh, I have loved the things of like art and good stories. My growth in loving poetry started because of children's poetry. And so I, early on as a parent, I, I had these ideas that people seem to be writing more about these days. And I'd read a little bit about, but I intuitively was starting to realize that there is the things of the culture that are so much more exciting, but there are the things that are real and beautiful that I needed to be purposeful in giving to my children so that they could at least, well, I hoped that I would totally form their tastes. Well, along the way, you learn that that doesn't happen. (laughs) That it's very circuitous and roller coastery. But when they were younger, I really thought that I could, by giving them all the good things, keep us from them wanting to love the Jonas Brothers. Yeah. Or who told you about that? One music? Direction. <laughs> yeah. You know? Which is really silly because actually we ended up in- introducing them to lots of different pop music as well. But, and I think in, in a perfect world that can happen, right? We, if you give your children good food and not as much candy, they will create a, a taste. They'll be able to eat it and have a taste for it. I think a poet did once say, your sons and your daughters are beyond your command. Right? <laughs> yeah, right? So I struggled with loving what I loved mm-hmm. for myself. Uh. And I would love it in a way for myself, but I was also loving it, holding hard, tightly, giving it to my children and say, hey, be formed by this. Wait a second. Wait a second. This is like how a didactic Presbyterian loves poetry. Exactly. It's so true. (laughs) Poetry as a moral lecture for you. Yes. Now, moral lecture, not because I was reading just moral poems to them. Okay. I really thought I was following Jesus. Right. By giving them beautiful things. I thought that that was a way to live holy lives. Yes. I thought I was going to like be able to sidetrack the ugliness in the world by giving them beauty. 
they still do love beautiful things while my daughter's in their 20s. We as a family are so nerdy that we will go to a museum all day long and enjoy each other's company That's and enjoy great. the museum. But we will also go to a Marvel movie at midnight and have a really good time. Okay. But there are other things that through their life, just like me when I was their age, ages, they love things that I'm like, I don't understand that. You know, but... That's that's all of us working yeah. through our sanctification. Yeah. So I held to it when they were younger with an agenda. Mm. And I couldn't I couldn't take in for myself the poetry and the beauty for a gift, a means of grace just for myself, offer it to my family with open hands and then see what God was going to do. I think parents need to be intentional. We can't just be like, well, whatever. We do need to be intentional. But that intentionality needs to always, of course, be connected to praying and good church life yeah. and, and Bible reading. It needs to be part of the whole picture. Sure. So I know that seems not, obvious. Not, not but as, a, as, as a means of control, but as a way of life. Exactly. And I think that way of life needs to come out of love. Mm. You know, it's, it's funny. I remember talking to a Catholic friend once who said that Catholicism is a way of life for, for many American Catholics. It's a way of life loosely connected to some doctrines out there. Mm -hmm. And Protestantism is a doctrinal system that really doesn't have a way of life. Oh, wow. Isn't that something? Wow. Yeah. That yeah. Is, yeah. So I think it starts with love. So if we were going to be practical about it, I think um, I'm saying this because of myself. You can't just say, OK, we're going to like add this into our life. And you as a, a parent have no idea what you're doing. Here's the medicine. Exactly. Here's the medicine, or, kid. Open your mouth. Right. I think. And again, this I think this is the thing that's hard about poetry is that it is a long haul kind of right thing. And it's. Poetry is, you know, you're going to find, I just say practically find a poet, find a style of poetry that you resonates. like that resonates. Okay. That's, that's the practical. And then you offer it. So like for me, again, I'm a nerd. I would do pancake breakfasts and the girls would be home from college and we'd have pancake breakfast. It would be like, sometimes it would be paper plates. Other times it was the China and the table was set beautifully. And then we'd read poetry and sometimes they loved it. And sometimes they were like, okay, this is what mom loves to do. And we're going to do it. Right. So that's, that's one thing. They I were think prisoners in a way pancake prisoners with pancakes and China. But, but then there are other things like I like loved, I discovered haiku and just how fun that was. So again, yeah, we'll just say once again, I'm a nerd. I would just be like, okay, I'm going to read this out loud to you. Whoa. And so it was my love for it as they saw, I think that I loved it and they were going to listen. <laughs> so again, it's a mysterious Some of thing. those seeds have plant, you planted have grown up. Mm -hmm. Some of those seeds might grow up someday and some exactly. of those seeds might never Take root. Exactly. And so I don't, I honestly wish I had like, like if you were homeschooling, I could tell you what to do because then you have children in your house and they're kind of there with you. And I love the idea of like morning time uh, yeah. where you're working through reading scripture and you're going to read a little bit of Shakespeare and you're going to work, just read a poem and you're going to focus on that one poem all the time. Well, and, and if your kids are in school, you're going to have to be more intentional about that, right? Right. You're going to have to devote some time. You're going to have to put it on the calendar is right. what we say at In our a house. Way. So I think the other thing that we need to remember about poetry, like you had said, you need to find what you like. Don't be afraid to also add in things that make you laugh. Uh -huh. A lot of people like Shel Sil Silverstein. Steve. Oh, yeah. yeah. I, he never resonated with me, huh. but I know... I'm, I'm okay, also a snob, so <laughs> so I have some, but and I think he's funny, but he's not someone who I'm going to go out of my way to read. Sure. But there were, when the girls got older, there was a poet, he's still alive and he's a friend, Aaron Bells, and he had like three or four poems that would just make, that we would just laugh, and we still will pull them off the shelf and read them to each other and still laugh at the same yeah. joke. And then like... So I also would say, don't feel like you have to find the hard poems. Like find, 
find poets. They could be they could be classic. You know what would be in the you should make sure you read these poets, and then they could be other they could be contemporary poets. And the one that I wanted to share with everyone. There's, there's poets who are writing today, like Nikki Grimes. She's an African-American, and she's a Christian. And I discovered her just by going into the library, and there she was. And I kept finding her, and I'm like, oh, she's really cool. She has a new book that's come out that, of course, I can't remember the title. The whole book is a story written in Tonka, which is a type of uh, Japanese Huh. Poetry form. So there's going to be things I thought those, that... A tonka was a truck. Yeah, it is. But in medieval Japanese world, it was also a type of poem wow. that survived, like haiku. So, And that's like the form I like to write my poems in. So there are things, things that are written for children that if you go into Barnes & Noble, into... The kids section. There's a poetry section. Yeah. Just go grab things off and see what grabs your attention. Yeah. So okay. Here's the here's the card question for you and I, because around the table here with Leslie and I, we have seven children. Yes. All daughters. This is true. So it, I wanted to just talk with people about it, it, it's striking to me that you know you go b- back before Anne Bradstreet, right? Mm-hmm. Almost all of the poetry is written by men. Yeah, the ones that you really get, the right. ones that are given to you. It's not mm-hmm. until we get to the Puritans that Puritans were so fanatical about educating mm-hmm. both men and women that you know you see that that is as like a, a time of real flowering mm-hmm. of what what women are what women are educated to do. Mm-hmm. So the what about boys? How do oh, we help, poetry for how boys. Do we, how do we help boys? Oh, of course. Love poetry. That's such a good question. Let's 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 brainstorm. Well, first of all, there are going to be fun poems that they would like. I wish I I wish we had Cindy Rollins sitting with us. Okay, she is an educator, has been within the classical world and within the Mason world. She is a mother of nine children, oh eight my. of whom are boys. Wow. So. Now, she was also a homeschooling mom. Okay. So I know when I speak about this, it's a little bit different because she was she was able to cultivate this in her family. Mm-hmm. But I know that she would say, there are, there are poems that are out there that aren't just funny, but they are full of honor. And these are the ones that we can also be giving to them. Yeah. So I... I so so the, 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 I remember as a child, the charge of the light brigade. Exactly. Right. So... You know, cannons to the left of mm-hmm. me, cannons to the right of me, cannons in front of me, and 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 I'm like, wow, yeah, that's so. So the content might need to be, you you might need to think about mm-hmm. what does a young man like. Mm-hmm. You know, what, what is he interested in? Also, some of the things that Tolkien writes in all of the Lord of the Rings. Yes. You know, I, I when I was teaching here and we were doing Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit, I said to the kids, do not skip. The poems. Uh Now, I'm saying that to you because I would. But it turns out you can't because they're so integral to what's going on in the story. So, you know, who knows if they believed me. But, you know, when I was reading out loud to them or they would be reading, we'd be like, okay, let's read that, you know, and let's find out, you know. And then what was really fun is we found out how each of his poems or songs would reflect the the character who was saying it or uh-huh. the character or the race of the person who was saying it. Right. And that was fascinating. Well, and it also connects you back into the stories of Cimmerillion as exactly. well. Exactly. So you're getting these stories that tell story. You're de- getting these poems or songs that tell stories and teach you or help you see bigger what's going on. Okay. Uh, so I did, so when I was, when I, um, when I was teaching here, I had the kids memorizing poetry often. And so s- seventh graders, we read, and I always said this wrong, Ozy- Ozymandias, Ozymandias. Ozymandias, yes, yeah. Yes, I always said his name wrong. Uh, well, I don't um, know if either of us are saying exactly, it correctly. Exactly, but you know what I'm talking about, you know, in the desert with all the sand and, you know, the statues falling over. And we just had a really good time with it. And again, mm-hmm. we're doing it within community. So this is the other thing that we need to remember about poetry. Yes, poetry can be is can be very personal because poetry has become very personal for me. Yeah. But poetry is also really supposed to be about 
community and people. Yeah. I mean, because really, when you think about the Psalms, the Psalms were written for the people. Right. You know, the songs of ascension is they're singing them all together, going up the mountain to, you know, J- Jerusalem. to Jerusalem. So poetry does somehow need to be. You can't just say to a child, here's the book of poetry, go off and read it by yourself and expect like, okay, now we're all wonderful. Yeah. Now they might want to eventually. But yeah. so I loved being in a classroom and working on those poems. And so in eighth grade, we, the first poem, when we were reading The Hobbit, we did The Lake Isle of Innisfree okay. by Yeats. And the first year we did it, this is this is so funny and also light, slightly embarrassing. So I had decided this would be the poem we're going to memorize. Uh-huh. You know, it's a classic and it's it's solid poetry. Uh-huh. Like I, it's it's only three stanzas, but it's just a great. I love it. But I had copy pasted it from a website, but I must have somehow done a typo because there's a line where the line goes something about a purple glow. The afternoon is a purple glow or something like that. And I had typed it in as cow. A purple so, cow. Exactly. And so I'm like, we're memorizing it. I don't even know if we realized it that year. Because to me, I'm like, you know, poets say weird things. Why couldn't it have been a purple cow somehow? And then Boy. eventually they're like, are you sure that's what it is? Yeah. So I look it up and I'm like, no, it's a glow. <laughs> so that became a joke. So it Maybe a glowing cow. I don't exactly. Know. But it was fun to memorize that poem because somehow it fit for me with The Hobbit and the story of The Hobbit yeah. and home life and, and the way a poet uses words. So uh, there are so many poets who, of course, were Yes, like you said, we're men. So you're gonna have there's there's so m- and there's so many good things to well, grab hold of. But, but but also there's new writers. I think her name is Shahib Nye. Naomi Shahib Nye. So she is a contemporary poet. I discovered her on like on my own, maybe through Poetry Foundation, like poetry a day, poem a day type type of thing. Uh-huh. And then loved the couple that I read. And then I was in Barnes and Noble and there is her work right there wow. on the children's on the so she she goes for she's broad okay and her poetry is definitely for anybody to read okay. because she's talking about everything from like an onion to meeting someone at an airport to things that kids can struggle with children will struggle with because she even if she's not someone who is maybe following Jesus mm-hmm. she has somehow she sees and he, connects to the human experience that that names what it means to be human in a way all of us can connect to yeah and so and that's also how I feel about Billy Collins I think he's a great one also to read to young people especially Mm. teenagers because he's just funny but he's funny because of his turn of phrase so those are good starting I think so I don't know if I really answered the question well but I think what I wanted to really try to say is for a parent to find find what you love. Yeah. Start there. You know, give yourself that time to say, what is it that I'm going to love? And it, like, hopefully we'll talk a little bit sometime about Malcolm Geit. That might be what you offer to your family. Yeah. Because, like, Malcolm Geit, also Lucy Shaw, they could be someone who you could just easily place just even into your holidays, into the church calendar. Right. So whether you're someone who follows a lot of the church calendar or whether you just follow a few things or maybe... There's hardly anything of the church calendar you follow, but you get, say, Malcolm Geitz sounding the seasons. And he has poems that are about the Annunciation. He has poems that are focused throughout Lent and Advent. He has poems about the the apostles. Mm. And you can just say, oh, it's Sunday and we're having dinner together. I'm going to read this poem to you. And the thing, here's the other practical thing, is don't immediately jump into, well, what do you think it's about? Like, what I have found, um, I work with, I, I'm a contributor to something online called The Black Barn, uh-huh. and it's a beautiful online community. If you ever feel cynical about online community, and you're like, there's no way it can happen he- in a healthy way, uh-huh. just go to Black Barn. It's wonderful. The conversations that happen there, it's just been a wonderful experience. Hmm. And I do, every Monday, I've done this ahead of time, but it's called Borrow Word, Borrowed Words, and I have posted a poem, 
given some background information about the poet or the poem, and then I've asked questions. And the questions start with, actually, not a question, but a do this. Read the poem. Read the poem several times. Read the poem several times out loud. And now I post shorter poems. I don't post things that are two pages long. And then I ask, because maybe this is as far as someone can go. What words grabbed your attention? Mm. What surprised you? What phrases made you go, oh, I've never thought about that before? The purple cow. Exactly. Yes. No. What words did you need to look up? So like when we did the Innisfree, I had to look up what a linnet was. It's a bird. I oh. didn't know that. I mean, I think I knew that because it said linnet's the, wings. The context, But yeah. I needed to know, right, the context, but I didn't know what the bird looked like. Sure. So- It might be that you just go with your family. We're going to read this. What words do you hear? What word don't you know? And then you could go to what connections, what alliterations. I love the alliteration game. A lot of times kids like the alliteration game, especially if they're looking at a copy of it. Like, do you see in the two lines next to each other or like one above the other? Are there sounds that are repeated? What are those words? So you want to look for those things. And then another question that has really helped open people up, because I've had many women say to me, I've never liked poetry. And now I can't wait till Monday to read the poem you've posted and get to listen and learn and share my thoughts. And then some women, now we're working on writing poetry. Some women are like, and now I'm writing poetry. So it's really cool. It fulfills the teacher thing in me. But I actually ask the question, do you have a story in your life or a Mm. story that you've read that can connect to this poem and can enlarge the poem for us? And that just, that's good. Yeah. And then you can talk about what it's about, but you also don't have to. Yeah. So. Because, because the end of that poem is not the dissection of it, but letting it bring you inspiring your imagination yeah. bringing you into that enchantment mm-hmm. yeah well it's been enchanting to talk with <laughs> thank you, today, you so much Leslie. i've loved it and we're going to give another little special treat because in a podcast that's going to follow along after this one you're going to read us a few poems and and talk yes. we're going to talk about them a little bit I'm so excited but thank you very much for coming in today and being on cultivate thank you for asking me to do my favorite thing You've been listening to Cultivate, the podcast of Veritas Academy, a preschool through 12th grade classical Christian school in Leola, Pennsylvania. If you would like to learn more about Veritas, please visit veritasacademy.com to discover the truth, beauty, and goodness of classical Christian education.